All right, so good morning to you all. And um, we have another meeting. And the concept which I want to share with you is utility. Um, utility is something, um, if I can define it, utility is the want satisfying power of a commodity or a service. So for example, uh, if something or some, some, some product or some service is adding to your satisfaction, giving you happiness, uh, makes you, gives you a sense of achievement, then that product or a service has utility. And if it doesn't have it, you will not buy it. Um, you buy food because it gives you utility, because it satisfies your want. And then you buy a type of food, and you don't buy a certain type of food, because a certain type of food does not give you satisfaction. But you buy a certain type of food because it gives you satisfaction. Uh, we wear clothes because they protect us, but then we wear certain type of clothes, but we don't certain, we don't wear certain type of other clothes because something gives you satisfaction, you buy it, and something doesn't give you, gives you satisfaction and you don't buy it. And something which gives you satisfaction, uh, you like to purchase it, and that's why you pay the price for it. And something which is not interesting, something which you which is not giving you any satisfaction, you don't purchase it, and as a result, even that product is cheaper, you never buy it. For instance, if you are a student of economics, and you have uh, exam to come, and you also have some assignments to submit, and I recommend your textbook. Now the textbook is important for you to get the grades, to get the uh, good performance, to give the good performance, and you, you find that this book is useful to you. It will satisfy your academic needs, or it will give you some academic satisfaction. You pay a price for it. But if you have the economics exam in two months time, and you, are, you go to the bookshop, and you find that the price of the book is going up, because maybe there are many students who are desperate to buy the book and the supply is less. So demand is more, supply is less. It could be possible that the price of the book goes up that time. So you have to buy the book expensive, but you will buy it because it gives you satisfaction. On the contrary, you go to the same bookshop and you are complaining and cribbing that why this book has become expensive, uh, this economics book, and suddenly you see a section where the books of uh, some psychology or, 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 or something which is not related to your field has, is offered at 90% off. <laughs> Will you buy it for yourself? Of course you can buy it because there is somebody who's interested in psychology and you want to give him or her a present on birthday. But would you buy it for yourself, given that you don't have any interest in psychology? No. No. No, I wouldn't. You wouldn't, because that book is not giving you any utility. I have a question, if you don't mind. Uh, of course, I don't mind. So... I don't mind if you have questions. Are you speaking about marginal utility theory right now? Not, not yet. Not, not, we haven't gone that far yet. I'm just talking about the basic idea of utility, that what is called utility. Thank you. So the utility is something uh, which is the want satisfying power of a commodity or a service. By the way, you woke up early in the morning, uh, not people in Sri Lanka, because there is, it's already, uh, is, 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 you know, quite around 11 o'clock, 10.30, 11 o'clock, I guess. But in Finland or elsewhere, countries which are in the Western uh, hemisphere, you wake up early in the morning today, uh, maybe 
because the economics lecture gives you the utility. So this is a service which is giving you a utility. And if you are, I sent you a Zoom invitation that, hey, eight o'clock in the morning, someday we would have a lecture on astrophysics. <laughs> yes, you will not wake up. Not, not many of you will wake up because why would you? That's not something in which you are interested in unless you show interest. So basically utility is the one satisfying power of a commodity or a service. Um, each individual has a separate consumption function. Uh, the consumption function is, uh, you can see this mathematical equation here. So we can see that the consumption uh, is not one commodity or a service. Consumption includes several commodities and services. So you can see I wrote list of X1, X2, X3, X4. When I wake up in the morning, I begin my day. There are many commodities and services which I consume on daily basis. Some of them I consume more often. Some I, some I consume maybe once a week or maybe once in a month. So the different commodities and the different services which I utilize, uh, they vary from, for example, food. We consume at least two times a day. Uh, but the visit to the doctor, which is an important service, maybe once in a month or once in, a two, in, in two months. Uh, cinema, theater gives me satisfaction. I'm, I'm an ardent fan of uh, not the movies, but the theater, the, 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 the plays. But I don't uh, watch them. I don't visit theater every month, maybe after once in a three months. But still, it's a service. Still, it gives me utility. Nobody forces me to go there. Uh, I don't go to the science fair. So even if the ticket is sold at discount, I will not go it, go for it because it doesn't give me any utility. So we have a set of goods and services which we put together and that gives us C, consumption. So our consumption, uh, you can see if I speak in the mathematical way, it will be consumption C is a function of X1, X2, X3, X4, and Xn. So if I say in non-mathematical way, I would say that the consumption depends on uh, several goods and services like X1, X2, X3, and so on and so forth. So one thing you need to know that each individual has a separate consumption function. So if there is a bunch of goods and services which makes me happier, that doesn't necessarily makes you happier because we are different human beings, we are subjective. Uh, the way we perceive satisfaction is very different, okay? Um, a rational consumer, first of all, we, we, we stick with this, we get vetted with this word that we only consider rationality in economics, that the rational consumer. The rational consumer would always like to 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 to, to to have the maximum of satisfaction with the minimum of price you pay. Because remember, it's two-way traffic. I buy the book of economics because it gives me satisfaction. So what I get is satisfaction. What I give is the price. Are you with me? So if I end up giving a price more than what I, the satisfaction which I get from, then I would say that I think I made a bad decision. Right? If you, for example, go to a shop and you end up buying a outfit for yourself, um, but after you wear it, you find that, hey, I think um, the price I paid for this outfit is too much in comparison to the satisfaction I'm getting. You go to a restaurant and you order the food and you eat it, um, you eat food and then you, uh, you realize that actually uh, the food is not good and you end up paying price which is too high. So you think that maybe I made an irrational decision that so the traffic is not even but uneven. You pay more price but the satisfaction you get is comparatively less. On the contrary, it could happen that you, you buy something and the price is much cheaper than you expected and you 
it has happened with me that when I travel somewhere abroad and I go to some old bookshop, I always find some interesting books. <laughs> uh and and of course they are cheaper so i find that the the satisfaction which i get from that book uh, is more than the price which i pay so a rational consumer is always going to increase his or her satisfaction utility um at the minimum of price so you because we have a given budget you are students you have the limited budget well everybody has limited budget by the way and you want to make the best use of your uh, monetary resources. And that's only possible if you are a rational consumer and your aim is to get maximum satisfaction with the minimum of the sacrifice in the form of giving up your uh, financial resources, right? So every consumer uh, is, is a utility maximizer, uh, those who are rational consumers. One thing I, I uh, just want to discuss with you, maybe it's on the next slide, but I, I can discuss right now, that utility and satisfaction are similar, but not same. Remember, so far, I have been using the phrase utility and satisfaction as if they're one word, as if they're synonyms. Look at my first sentence. The utility is the total satisfaction a consumer gets. So I, I'm assuming that utility and satisfaction are same thing but i want to give you i want to ask you a question now they are not same utility and consumption they are not perfectly same why do you think i gave this statement that even though utility and satisfaction seems to be quite look alike but they are not same any idea? What do you think is the difference between utility and satisfaction, even though I'm consistently saying that they are quite similar? Hope you understood my question. Well, if you get, for example, an exercise bike, it would be of a very utility for you but mm -hmm. you may not wish to exercise and that's why you may not wish to buy the exercise bike even though it could be of a great utility well um okay so let's let's wait I would say that the satisfaction is a feeling what you get when you uh, make your wants to come true. Mm -hmm. And the utility is the means, uh, utility is the means to get them done. Basically the power or, well, I cannot say it any more clear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the means yeah. to get your needs uh, happen or wants happen. Okay. Uh Anybody else? Yane, when you started, you were very close to the exact meaning, but then you went a little bit. <laughs> you, you drifted away. <laughs> you drifted away afterwards. <laughs> uh, okay, maybe I can, I can tell the way I understand. Utility is a pre-consumption phenomenon, and satisfaction is the post-consumption phenomenon. I am drawn by a textbook of economics, so much so that I start walking to the city center to buy it. Because I have a strong feeling that this book will give me satisfaction. Uh, I mean, this book will give me some usefulness. And then I go there and then I buy the book and I start reading it and I feel actually satisfied after I read the book. So the value judgment that we attach to a good or a services before we consume it, that is called utility. But when we use it, then, it, then come the word satisfaction, if we get it or if we don't get it. Does it make sense? 
you come to economics class you wake up in the morning and you have been waiting that yes tomorrow is a very important lecture we must attend it you set the alarm you go to bed early you you make all the arrangements to wake up early in the morning this is the utility this is the utility you attach some tag some value you give but that's a pre-consumption phenomenon and then you attend lecture and you are disappointed absolutely disappointed this is the satisfaction which you never got or maybe you got very low level of satisfaction make sense Oh yeah, but uh, can you call utility also a expectation? Yes, utility is an expectation. All right, all right. Yeah, but sometimes uh, you see what uh, I I Yane, I'll be a little bit careful in using the word expectation uh, because there are certain things which expectation is more like a random. There's some kind of some element of randomness in in expectation. Yeah. Yeah. But utility is that I. There's a, there's a little bit of more intensity of your want. You really want to get it. So you want to believe that it will satisfy you. <laughs> because okay. otherwise you would never go and purchase it. We never do random shopping. When you go to Prisma or, or any store, you make a list of the goods and services which you will get from the store. You only pick up those things which you really are looking forward to. So you don't expect them. You, you are very sure that, hey, this is something which I take. This is something I, do, I don't take. Uh, this is the shampoo which I take and the next shampoo lying, I don't use it, so I don't take it. So that is the utility you attach. Now, it could be possible that the food which you have brought is rotten, uh, is not good, is expired, whatever. Then it comes the element of satisfaction. But the value which the mental judgment, the psychological value which you attach to certain things is utility. So you can say that it's a strong sense of expectation. Make sense? Yes, thanks. Yeah, and so one thing you need to keep in mind that the utility is a pre-consumption phenomenon. You haven't started consumption yet when it comes to utility, but when it comes to satisfaction, this is like a tried and trusted. You have seen something, you consume something. We are so desperate to go on holidays and share. So let's we, let's go. We make all the plans and everything. We buy the, you know, we buy our. Uh, uh, the hotel, uh, not by the hotel, but we, we book the room, we buy our tickets and everything and all kind of preparations. That's a utility. But we haven't been to the destination yet. When we go there, we experience it. That is called satisfaction. Okay. So, yeah, to see it, to believe it. Um, Utility is, is the important foundation of the modern day business world. Unless something is useful, you never consume it, right? Because consumer is the king. As you study in marketing, that consumer is a very important component. And, and unless you, you, you have utility for something, you would never buy it. And only those things are bought, which are purchased, which have high utility. So you can see that you only demand. So the demand for those products which have less utility uh, will be down. Like, like for example, uh, these days, uh, you must not be born that time. When I was young in my early teens, even before my teens actually, uh, we used to have only black and white TV. Uh, there was no system of color TV in India. Um, but nowadays, there's hardly anybody who uses black and white TV, unless it's in some archives or in some museums. Uh, because the utility that we get from the TV, the black and white TV is no longer valid. So with the technological uh, things, advancements, our utility pattern also changes. Uh, now comes what Blot was saying, the diminishing marginal utility. Um, 
Last week, when we met in, in the lecture theater, we discussed that some wants are sashable. You cannot fulfill all your wants uh, because of the limited uh, resources, but there are some wants which we can fully satisfy. And the diminishing marginal utility is basically pointing out to the same thing that if there are certain things, if you take one thing at a time and you consume more of it, more and more of it, eventually you don't want any more consumption. Do you get my point? When you are hungry and you are not just hungry, but you're famished, you really want, uh, you haven't had your lunch for several hours and you're really desperate to have food and you start consuming your food and eventually uh, you have one, portion, second portion, third portion, so on and so forth. Eventually you say no more food. So it means that the, the final dose of the final portion of food uh, has given you the minimum utility in comparison to the first do portion of food when you are really uh, desperate to eat. Uh, if you're thirsty, the same thing, you want to drink water, you want to have another glass of water, you yeah, want another glass of water. But the third glass of water which you drink will give you lesser utility uh, than the first glass of water. So, because there are certain, there are wants which are uh, fully satiable, you can satisfy them. You can't satisfy all the wants together in, in a group, in a bundle, uh, in a package, but if you take the consumption of one good at a time, uh, they are satis they can be satisfied, right? So th that comes the concept of the marginal utility, that the additional satisfaction which you get from the consumption of a commodity or a service, it goes down as you continue the consumption repeatedly, repeatedly. Like in, the, in case of the economics book, uh, if I give you a reference that this book is really great and you want, you buy the first book, you, you buy it and you start reading it, you study it, uh, you have gone through a chapter, but if you read this chapter once again and again and again, I, I don't think you will be uh, adding anything to your knowledge or if you end up buying multiple copies of the same book. So you, I ask you to buy the book and you bought two copies, three copies. Why did you buy three copies, by the way? That, that will not make you knowledgeable three times. Okay, so this is the idea of diminishing marginal utility. Of course, in my slide, I didn't give you the example of book or anything. I chose something which, mm -hmm. so yeah, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so there is, um, there are some, some things which you which gives you satisfaction over the night that I'm talking about. Um, now I have a question for you. Do you think that the principle of diminishing first of all you have to give me an answer that you understood the phenomenon of diminishing marginal utility? And secondly, you need to answer me that do you agree that the principle of diminishing marginal utility is uh, applicable universally across the board, or do you notice any exceptions to it? So let's have some discussion about it. First of all, do you understand this mechanism of DMU, diminishing marginal utility? And secondly, uh, do you agree, disagree, especially you disagree? Um, and if you can give me some examples which highlight that the, the principle of DMU doesn't apply throughout. So this is how the diminishing marginal utility, if I put them in numbers, sorry, it looks like. So you can see that if you have more consumption and see it's very important that I write the unit of consumption Writing the unit of consumption is very important. There's always a commodity or a service which is offered in certain uh, reasonable size of the unit. Now, before I discuss this example, I, I take, take, take back uh, what I was discussing with Hannah and others, is that 
Visualize a situation. You come running home. You've been jogging or you've been running out of fear or panic and you want to drink water. And the, the reasonable unit of serving water is a glass. And you are served water in spoon. So now if I say that the satisfaction you get from the first spoon of water is more and the satisfaction you get from the second and third and so on, a spoon of water you get is less then I would be totally talking nonsense. The reason is that the unit of serving water is not the spoon. It is the glass of water. The glass can be big or small depending upon, but at least we are, I hope we more or less, we have a consensus that the reasonable unit of consumption or serving uh, water is the glass. But if you're serving in some too big or too small unit, uh, then the utility, this DMU law doesn't apply. If somebody is offering me water in, this, in spoon for a second, third, I would steal the whole, I would just grab uh, the, the full, the, 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 the utensil which contains whole water and maybe I drink straight away from that because uh, my, my patients would give up. So there is, has to be a certain uh, unit of consumption. So we need to keep in mind that if the unit is kind of odd, awkward, uh, then the law doesn't apply. Okay, so you see that as you consume something, Mm, we can't hear you, Shab. Yeah, I can't hear as well. Mm. That's a good thing. Sorry about this. Okay. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you need to give me the recording permission again, sir. Sir, can you hear me? I think your your mic is mute. Hello, uh, folks, can you hear me? I can, yes. Okay, I think now Seher is... Uh, uh, Seher, can you hear? Maybe I call Seher. The record is on, I think it got continued, like automatically. Uh, yeah, I think it's getting recorded. Yeah, I, I can see it's getting recorded here. Yeah. Okay, I hope it does. So we can see that, uh, sorry for this interruption. So we can see that the, the, the utility level uh, as you consume is going up. But see what, the most important thing is that the pace at which your utility is increasing. So when you consume the first unit, you get the same amount of total utility. So when you consume second, your total utility goes up, but the pace at which the incremental utility, which goes up uh, is decreasing. And as you keep increasing the consumption of the unit, you, the, the commodity or the service you're interested in, um, your total utility goes up. But eventually, if you see between nine and 10, um, it could be so that your level of satisfaction actually uh, utility goes zero and in fact negative. 
Um, negative utility um, is a bit tricky to explain. When something have a something you think will satisfy you, but actually dis dissatisfies. So there are two things: satisfaction, no satisfaction, and dissatisfaction. So why you consume something? Because you have a perception that it will give you more satisfaction. So it will give you utility. But eventually, when there is no additional satisfaction, we say that the marginal utility is zero. But if you consume something and it, if it has a side effect, it actually have a, it kicks you back, then we can say that it actually is giving you a negative satisfaction. So the, the marginal utility is negative. And you know that if you consume something, if you are very hungry, uh, there is some chat, sorry. Ah, no worries. Okay. So if you consume something, uh, if you're hungry and you eat food, more you eat, more satisfaction, uh, your, your satisfaction, total satisfaction increases. Eventually you say no more food. Uh, it means that when you say no more food, I'm done. When you say I'm done, it means that your marginal utility is zero now. But if you still insist to eat, then you may fall sick. You can, you know, um, then, then it means that the satisfaction or the marginal utility is negative when you have that, this kind of situation that you, the, instead of satisfaction, it's dissatisfaction. Um, if somebody's drinking a beer for relaxation, it's fine, but eventually that person says no more drink because you know that it's, it's fine, it's over, but if you drink more, then it can have the negative impact. We all know what could be the negative impact of drinking of too much of alcohol. So it means it's negative marginal utility. And if you plot it, it looks like this. And here, this is some kind of formulation, but I must say that the marginal utility of nth unit, uh, look at the cursor where I'm moving, is equal to total utility of n unit minus total utility of n minus one, one less unit. I can show from here. The total utility, the marginal utility of fifth unit is 74. And the total utility of the fourth unit is 66. So it means that when you consume fifth unit, the additional, the incremental utility is eighth, uh, is eight. So this is the addition to the utility. This is the increment. And as you consume more and more and more, this incremental utility goes down, 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 eventually zero. And if it goes, uh, zero is a warning. When you get the marginal utility zero, it means that your certain want is fully satisfied. So no more increment. It's an advice to you that don't consume more uh, unit to it. But if you never learn from this signal and you keep consuming, it means you rather act irrationally than get ready for the negative satisfaction, which means that it, the thing which you are consuming will have the side effects on you, on your body, on your health, on your mental health. Okay, So this we need to keep in mind. And when you plot them, you see that the total utility curve is going up because more you consume, more total utility you achieve. But keep in mind that this is not rising like this. This is not rising linearly in a linear fashion. Rather, it's getting more and more like, uh, how to say it? It's more like a concave. It's like a concave to the origin that it's. It means that, uh, that the additional increment goes up. So you can see here, uh, in the beginning, the total satisfaction goes up very sharp, but eventually the speed, the velocity at which your total utility is rising is becoming very flat, very flat. The curve is very less and eventually uh, it's almost parallel to X axis and eventually it goes even down. And if you look at the curve, when you consume the first unit, the total utility and the marginal utility is same, as you can see from the table also. 
because when you have zero pint of beer, there is zero total utility and there is a zero marginal utility. But when you have the first one, the whole thing is the increment. The whole thing is the addition. And uh, you can see here that the marginal utility curve is going down. And when your total utility uh, stops increasing, then your marginal utility is zero. Uh, you can see from here that from here to here, there is no addition. Uh, there is no addition to total utility. It means that the marginal utility is zero. But if you consume more, then your marginal ut utility can be even negative. So it can go down. Never reach a, a stage. Uh, that would be a completely irrational behavior of a consumer or a firm. Uh, if consumer consume beyond the marginal utility zero, then it's an irrational consumption act. And if a, con if a firm is producing uh, beyond where the marginal productivity is zero, then the firm has a rational or irrational act of uh, production. So never go beyond when your marginal utility, if you're a consumer and the marginal productivity, if you are a seller, uh, goes zero. Never go beyond that. And very quickly, we, we have some factors of production. Uh, broadly speaking, we have land, labor, capital, and enterprise. So this is a new topic, a uh, new idea. So if you have any, if you still have any question about this whole thing, this utility, please, you can ask me now before I move on to the next topic. Mm -hmm. But we can come back whenever you want. And then we have the factors of production. Uh, labor, land, capital, and enterprise. And I think it's very self-explanatory that the labor is, uh, in, in economics, uh, the labor includes not just the, the literal sense, what we understand. Uh, labor includes both physical labor and the mental labor. So a person who works in a factory is a labor, is a laborer. And the president or the prime minister is also laborer. Remember, I didn't write laborer, landlord, capitalist, and entrepreneur. I wrote labor, land, capital, and enterprise. Because in economics, we don't discuss people. We discuss function. So we don't give the adjective, uh, the name, the tags, to the person. So we, we don't study them in the personal capacity. We study them in the functional capacity. So when you pay wage to a worker, a minimum wage, for example, you are not actually giving to the laborer. You are handing over to the laborer for the labor he, he or she has done. Do you get my point? If a laborer comes, you call a laborer, like a janitor, like an electrician, he comes, does nothing. Would you still pay him or her? Hopefully not. But when this laborer comes to your place, uh, remove the blockade from the pipes, do the electricity connection set. So now this laborer is giving you a labor and you, in turn, give the reward or the compensation for the labor this laborer has done. So essentially, you are paying not for the laborer, but you are paying to the laborer for the labor. Make sense? So this is why in economics, we include the reward based on the functional capacity, not in the personal capacity. The land you, you take on rent, you pay rent on it. But you are paying rent because the land is giving you uh, a service. Land is giving you some facility. The landlord is only the recipient of rent on behalf of 
the land. And by the way, in economics, land, the buildings or uh, land is the, land includes everything and anything on the surface of earth, uh, underneath the earth and above the earth. So land is all free gift of nature, which we receive directly from the, 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 the nature. Uh, the, the, the rent which you pay for your apartment is not the economic rent, but it's more like a scarcity rent because there's a shortage of places where you live in. If, if we have unlimited apartments uh, on, on this earth, then you will not pay rent for this. So this is because of the scarcity. Uh, same way, uh, the, we pay interest on the capital you borrow uh, to, to run the factories or to buy the machines and to, to purchase tools. Uh, but this interest which you pay uh, goes to capitalist, but not to the capitalist for his uh, looks or for his appearance, but it's because you utilize the capital owned by so the capitalist is only the owner of capital. Uh, capitalist is only the owner of capital, but you use his or her capital, like you take loan from the bank, you pay interest to the bank, but the bank is only the collector of interest for the capital you have used. Okay. And the enterprise may I ask you, what does entrepreneur gets? the labor gets wage. Um, in economics, there is no distinction between wage and salary. In, in accounting, I think we make this difference as wage and salary because normally uh, in accounting, wages uh, means more for the physical labor and the salaries are more for the mental labor. But e economics, there, you will not see the word salary um, given separately from the wage in economics, because in, in, in economics, we include uh, white collar jobs, blue collar jobs as the same. We, so economics is more, uh, more equal than accounting when it treats the different types of work. Uh, land gets rent, capital gets interest. What does the enterprise get? Uh, the profit. Profit or? Some part of extra value. No, profits or what? When you are an entrepreneur, Income? are you? No, 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 wait a second. If you are an entrepreneur, you're, you start some project, are you 100% sure that you will have the profits only? Mm, you cannot be sure. Risks. You can have losses also. When you, when, you, when you make some, uh, when you run your enterprise, when you have a startup, um, would you be sure that after every month or ever, after every quarter, you will only have the profits? Or, or will you, can you have losses also? Well, it would be a catastrophe if we get uh, in, into minus on, on the first month of a startup, but it's possible. Well, it's possible because if you, if you see uh, the life cycle of startups, I think more than 75% of them, they, they never mature to the next phase because, of, because they can't survive. And when I use the word survive, it means they don't have the profits. They don't have the financial. So if you look at the labor, I do labor. Um, I'm, my risk at... I get my salary. Uh, you give your land property on rent, you get the interest uh, rent. You give loan to somebody and they give you interest, but the enterprise is something where you are supposed to get that. You're expected to get the profits, but there's no guarantee that you'll get them. Because in the businesses, in the businesses, uh, it's like uh, ups and downs. So the enterprise is the very risky, so if I have to arrange 
different factors of production on the basis of riskiness of success, then I think the entrepreneurs are the riskiest one because there is no surety. When you do your job, Vlad, uh, you know that after one month you will get the salary. For sure, you will get. Um, if you have some apartment to rent, you know that you will get rent. If you have given loan to somebody, you know that this bank or this institution which, you, which is using your money will give you interest. But there is no such surety. Of course, expectations are there, but there's no guarantee that you will get the profits from your enterprise. You may have losses. Excuse well. me? Yeah. Uh, if you are a worker on a factory, mm. which is owned by some guy and when this factory gets no longer profitable uh, the guy gets bankrupt and i get fired and i get no salary you are thinking too far uh, i'm talking about the normal course of business normal course let's say you got a job in kpmg after you graduate Uh, how, how what's the probability what is the probability that kpmg will become bankrupt one month after you get a job let's say very small okay now you have a building and kpmg rents from you what is the guarantee that kpmg will not pay you rent next month same Okay, now you have the extra money which you can deposit or you can lend to somebody and you prefer to buy the bonds issued by Bank of Finland. So basically you are giving loan to Bank of Finland. What is the guarantee that the Bank of Finland will not pay you interest next month? Uh, let's say the same. But okay. I'm not 100% uh, sure. Maybe it's higher. Okay. Now, now, think from think as an entrepreneur of KPMG. KPMG is a consultancy company, yeah. And the consultancy business uh, between E and Y, Price Waterhouse Cooper, and McKinsey, KPMG is highly competitive. And it could be possible that KPMG lose a bid against the other competitors in the market and KPMG have losses next quarter. So even in the normal day-to-day -day business, when the other factors are not expected to have the losses or the negative wage or the negative rent, the entrepreneur, even in the normal course of time, in the normal usual business situations, uh, they can have losses. Look at some time, I will show you uh, when we move away from a little bit towards finance that the big companies in the world, which are very credible, massive, they have billions of assets worth. Uh, their, their assets are even more than some of the uh, country's GDP. Even they have losses. Have you seen Tesla's uh, profits in the last three, four years, how they fluctuate? Unfortunately, no. Yeah, you should see. Tesla is making a lot of money, but if you see Tesla's profits not long ago, maybe two years ago, you'll see that it, they were going down massively. And this was not, not a shock. This was in the normal course of business. But believe me, even at that time, the, the staff of Tesla was getting salaries. The problem happens to, to an entrepreneur, to an enterprise, if the losses become very big and very chronical, but because we are talking here in a normal situation, in the normal situation, uh, you don't lose wages. In the normal situation, you don't lose rent. In the normal situation, you don't lose your interest. But even in the normal situation, an enterprise can have losses. So if we are speaking of a normal situation, mm -hmm where nothing more or less goes wrong. Why do we need a capitalist? Capitalist? Well, the capitalist provide the capital. If you are a company, if you are uh, Bill Gates or uh, uh, Elon Musk, 
uh, when you start the company, you need financial resources. And the financial resources don't come from your own pocket. Uh, of course, you invest your own money, but when you want to upscale your business, you, you need to borrow money from the banks. You need to issue shares to the shareholders so that people, uh, institutions, they also invest in your company so you get funding. And when you borrow from some companies, some institutions, you pay them interest. There's no company in the world which uh, is a public company and it doesn't borrow, it, it, it borrows. All the companies do borrow from the outside resources. Because the, the, when the company is expanding, you need to buy more land, more machinery, you need to recruit better trained uh, workforce. You want to move your operations from Finland and you want to set up your subsidiaries in Malaysia, in India, in, in, in Africa. So you need more resources. So then you'd like to get resources from outside. There's no company in the world um, which is 100% self-financed. It's possible when you're a small company that you are fully self-financed, but then your needs are limited. But when you upscale your operations, then you need to go to the public uh, for the share capital, for the debt capital. Vlad? Well, okay, but why shouldn't we just hire a pair of two top managers who get the salary as mm -hmm. we on the factory are? And they will manage what to borrow and what to not, and mm -hmm. what not to, and the effect will be the same. Why do we need a capitalist? Look, do you know the concept of shareholders of a company? More or less. Okay. Are they also running the company by themselves? Mm. They hire someone for this? They hire somebody. So that, that, there yes. we go. Yes. The entrepreneur. And mm -hmm. yes, that's what the entrepreneurs do. But if, even though, why do we need an entrepreneur? Uh, anything that does an entrepreneur is get the money mm -hmm. for having, for possessing the assets we use. It means that he gets money, he or she gets money just for existing. If they hire other people to control their resources, if the only thing they do is the is ask about the daily reports or something from their board of directors. I'm, I'm not getting very clear uh, points, what you're trying to say, but what I, the way I understand that the entrepreneur is the one who combine land, labor, and capital together to produce something and then sell those things in the market. So if there's a labor, land, capital lying, scattered, and there's no entrepreneur, there's no enterprise to combine them so that you can run the production, you can provide the service, then there'll be no business operations. So the entrepreneur is the organizer of all these economic activities. Wow. And when you put these activities yeah. together, then you run your show, and depending upon the market situations, depending upon your own caliber, depending upon your entrepreneurial skill, you can have the profits, and if you are, if your entrepreneurial skills are not good, or if you are a good entrepreneur, but in the bad times, the market is very bad, then you end up having losses. Well, what, what stops uh, an amateur entrepreneur who just started uh, to hire a manager? Uh, to have a loan and to hire a manager on that loan and then he or she does nothing from the start 
because the organizational matters are handled by a top manager hired by him or her on the loan, which is taken by him or her. Does anybody uh, want to contribute what Vlad is saying? Do you understand his uh, point of view? Not really. No. Yeah, I think I'm also finding it a little bit complicated to understand. But the way I understand is that um, I don't know in which direction the, we are discussing this thing. But the way I don't want to discuss with you yet uh, how the corp the companies work, uh, how the C what CEO is doing or what CFO is doing. But at this moment, I want to keep the discussion very balanced and very basic and rooted. Is that there are we are not going to the corporate sector yet. We are in economics, okay? So in economics, we broadly categorize factors that there is a land, which is an important thing to produce some good or service. And then there is a capital which require resources to run the show. And here capital doesn't mean the, the financial capital, not the shares of these things. Here capital means the physical capital like machinery, like building, uh, like a computer, like a typewriter, all those basic things which you require to run the business. Um, and then you need a labor, which means that includes the factory workers and also the top managers. Uh, all of them are labor. And then you combine all these people. And then there's a guy, the person, who is combining all these factors together in a combination, in a proper proportion, that the company, the business runs. And when the business runs, uh, you this entrepreneur's job is also to check that there's a market where he or she can sell his products. And if all things go well, uh, the entrepreneur is a visionary. Uh, he has got the best of resources. Uh, I mean, the lab, labor, land, and capital at the minimum of the cost, uh, get most of their efficiency, uh, produce at the lowest possible cost and the highest quality. Uh, those goods are sold in the market. There's a revenue and all these factors are paid well. Then the business continues. It sustains. But if the entrepreneurial decisions are wrong, you have the wrong labor for the wrong job and not right people at the right job, land, the resources you have uh, borrowed, uh, taken very expensively or rather unnecessarily, uh, you, don't, you haven't done any marketing research, you are taking wrong decisions, so then you are a wrong entrepreneur. So in this case, the board of director can, can be an entrepreneur and you make a wrong decision, then the company's cash flow can go down. And hence, uh, your entrepreneurial decisions can, be, can bring losses to the company. Uh, if they bring losses to the company, which is a part of the normal business, so don't get shocked, surprised, if you have losses in certain times, because unlike salary, your profits are never uh, guaranteed, never taken for granted. Uh, they, there may be losses, even in the business as usual, uh, but if these losses, they become massive, and if these losses become chronic, this is where uh, the companies need some restructuring uh, and bringing some improvement, something in their entrepreneurial capacity. And if it continues, then the business goes bust, simple. And if the business goes bust, it could be possible that it's taken over by the other company. So this is the normal routine that how the business is run. But uh, Vlad, I, I'm deliberately not going to the corporate sector activities yet because that may not be, uh, that may be too uh, early to discuss these things. So this is what I basically means. And uh, if you have any points to share, please go ahead. If anything, you want to make addition to it. Uh, the CEO of the com company is basically, um, you can call that person as a top manager. Uh, but the board of directors, which make this leadership, this make decisions, um, combining these different things, and, and, and including CEO uh, uh, himself, herself, uh, these are the entrepreneurial decisions. In the big companies, if you notice, 
Um, people like Steve Jobs, people like Elon Musk, people like uh, CEO of uh, PepsiCo or Coke or these kind of big companies, uh, these CEOs, even though they are paid salary, so the salary which they get is more like a managerial job. So you do a managerial job and you get the salary or a wage. But a larger part of the compensation which these top CEOs in the world get is coming from the share capital. It means that these CEOs are also entrepreneurs. And if you see, uh, I would show you one day when we go a bit further, that in the modern world, there are companies whose CEOs are getting 95% of their total pay package in the form of shares. It means that apparently they are salaried people, they are managers, they come in the labor category, but the reward which they get is in the form of stocks. Means the, the, the CEOs are also the owners partly of the company so that they have, they are taking care of the company in a better way they their their relationship with the company becomes more strong more attached if you are a company whose assets are of hundreds of million or even billion uh, dollars and the ceo is only getting salary then his attachment with the company his affiliation with the company will not be so strong and he can make wrong decisions and just go away but if the most of the salary the CEO is getting is coming from the shares, okay? Then if the company loses, then his salary is also lost. So therefore, uh, the modern day CEOs, especially of the big companies, are not just laborers, they're also the entrepreneurs, okay? So this is a very interesting thing that when a company is in, in a very early stage, uh, like a startup, uh, the CEO of the company and the, and the owner, the shareholder are the same thing. And as it grows bigger, the same sense of affiliation develops. But all I want to say here is that if you want to produce something, then you need basically four factors of production, uh, labor, land, capital, and enterprise. Enterprise is very important because entrepreneur is the one who brings all these factors together. If there's no entrepreneur, uh, labor, land, and capital would never be in touch with each other. What is a factory? What is production? Production is combining all the factors together. And the binding force which brings them together is the enterprise. If there's no enterprise, nobody's coordinating, connecting these factors, then there'll be no production and no economy. So the role of entrepreneur is very important, but there's no success guaranteed for sure. So that's it for our today. And uh, we continue on Thursday in the classroom, four o'clock, okay? And then we start our next chapter. But the slides of the next chapter are already uh, in, the, in the study material in Moodle. Questions, comments? Uh, if you excuse me mm -hmm. for speaking again, no, I no, have no. a question. Will we be discussing any other theories other than marginal utility theories? Um, our course will last till uh, December, I guess. And this is September, so October, November, we have two more months to include, to study many things. So we will not be, studying, we, we will not be studying, are... we will not be studying diminishing marginal utility for next two months, Vlad. I just wanted to make sure that the other theories may also be covered by the course. Well, as I mentioned, and I hope you understood that we will be studying more and more contents uh, till early December. 
So we will not be studying. Okay, I get it. Thank we you. will not be studying diminishing marginal utility for next two months. Next week, actually, I want to start the market mechanism, but how the market system works, uh, the forces of demand and supply. Then afterward, my plan is to discuss about the different kinds of markets forms in the world. And then I want to take you to the board of directors of a real company that how does the board of directors work, what they do and what they don't. And then we will have some discussion about the financial economics that how the financial institutions in the world work. And then one day I'll come back to fiscal and monetary policy again, because I know that I've discussed uh, monetary policy uh, quite a lot, but I haven't touched the fiscal policy much. So one day I'll come back to fiscal policy. So there are plenty of topics to follow. Okay, so I think we need to complete our meeting today and uh, I pause the recording.